Good evening and welcome to a dark and autumnal Isla. We're here in the Laddie shop to discuss whisky in a changing climate. And while sustainability has always been on our minds, COP26 happening in Glasgow right now seems as good a time as any to address some of our responsibilities and our concerns and hopefully some of the solutions. It's been a pressing topic for many in the industry and beyond, with the Scotch Whiskey Association setting targets for us to reach net zero. There's also targets in place for us to reduce our packaging and our waste, but what role does agriculture have to play in this space? We're really keen to draw on a panel of experts, including fellow head distillers, CEOs and founders, and also some agronomy experts this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to invite them into the session and carry on with our agenda this evening. So the first to join me is going to be Annabelle Tom Thompson, who joins us from Nickneen. Hello, Annabelle. Can you hear us okay? I can. Hello. Can you hear Hi. me? Yes. Thank you for joining us. Let me start by saying congratulations on your net zero on scope one and two this year. You must be immensely proud. Thank you very much. I'm just going to try and see if I can fix my camera. Hang on. There we go. Um, yes, indeed. So this year we uh, were verified net zero um, for scope one and two, which is basically our distillery operations. It's, um, it's a fantastic achievement, although actually it's just a measurement of what we've always been doing. We just haven't done a carbon footprint to date. So it's a kind of... Um, the accolade or the verification of what we've had in place from the start. Brilliant, great, yeah, it's it's great to be doing the things, but it's also be great to be um, actually putting them on paper and getting to tell people about them, so well done. That's we'll move on swiftly, but we'll come back to you, I'm sure. Uh, we also welcome David Thompson, um, who joins us from the Spirit of Yorkshire Distillery down south. Hello, David. You've got the most impressive backdrop out of all of us. <laughs> Where are you joining us from? Well, it's the first time I've uh, heard Yorkshire called us down south, so uh, <laughs> that's very interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're in uh, in Yorkshire, obviously, Spirit of Yorkshire, based on the east coast of Yorkshire. Um, Yorkshire's a, a fantastic uh, area. It's the biggest county in England. We have five and a half million people living here which I think is more than the population of Scotland. So, um, yeah, we're in a great place, great barley growing area. Um, and obviously we can talk about that later on. Brilliant. Well, thank you for joining us. And rounding out the distillers for the evening, we've got Douglas Taylor, who joins from Brookladdy, because we couldn't possibly host an evening without getting our or own or in there as well. <laughs> Welcome to the panel, Douglas. Thank you, Christy. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. We'll come back to you too, Douglas. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, um, it sounds like we could probably have a competitive game of football between Scotland and Yorkshire. You know, that's probably <laughs> about our level, isn't it? Uh, we'll take on a rugby, I think. Thank you. <laughs> I, I would fully endorse that. Um, next on the panel is Dr. Stephen Jones, who is joining us from the Washington State University Bread Lab. Steve, do you want to tell folk where you're joining from? other than what I've just said. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, we're in the States and we're north of Seattle, about an hour and a half. We're about as north and west as you can get in the U.S. So we're just below uh, Vancouver, Canada here. So really thrilled to be here today. Thank you. Brilliant. If you're watching from home and you want to see um, a bit more about the speakers in detail, there is a link on our website. So if you just click into the news section, there's a little bit of a rundown and a bit of background between everyone and you can be looking through various websites as we go along. Next up, who's joining us is Dr. Thierry Vran, who's based on Vancouver Island and is part of our um, Botanical Garden Conservation International Partnership, which we run through the Botanist Foundation. Thierry, hello. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm on Vancouver Island, just next to Vancouver, not far. A little north of Seattle, of course. Brilliant. Is it is it cold where you are <laughs> just now or not quite yet? Where I live is the mildest weather in Canada. It's very, very similar to Scotland. Okay, so mild for Canada. <laughs> 
Brilliant. Okay, and last but definitely not least is soon-to-be Dr. Richard Gantlett, who joined us from Yatesbury House Farm. Hello, Richard. Hi, Christy. A very good evening to you all. Pleasure to be here. Richard, you are also slightly biased on the discussion this evening, perhaps because you grow biodynamic barley for us at Bricladi. So you're coming in from a farmer and agronomy expert background, but you do have connections with us so far. Absolutely, yes. Been doing it for a long time now, over 10 years, which is, which is great. So thrilled to have this partnership and uh, so um, excited to be talking tonight about, about what we do and, uh, and how we do it. Brilliant. So we, we do have um, kind of slightly, uh, again, biased motivations for putting on the talk this evening. It is obviously about sustainability and whiskey in a changing climate. But coming up next week, we will be releasing our first ever biodynamic spirit. So the first harvest that Richard grew for us back in 2010, we will bottle and sell next week from the 16th of November. So um, if you enjoy the panel this evening, we hope you'll be going out to buy biodynamic Rafadi, Nick Nian and Spirit of Yorkshire whiskies. <laughs> so, um, we're, if, for those of you who don't know, we're particularly interested in agriculture because whisky is an agricultural product. So, whisky, if it's a single malt, is made from barley, and if it's a blended whisky, it's made from lots of different grains. So, obviously, we have a responsibility to steward the land and to help others steward the land to produce crops that we can then make into whiskey. So it's in our interest as distillers to protect the land and to nurture soils and to keep that healthy. So part of the reason why we've invited these experts this evening is to help educate us as distillers and also to show the rest of the industry and to you at home how you can support more sustainable farming systems and byproducts that help the system as a whole um, for the future of our planet. So it sounds like a very big optimistic idea but I'm confident that with the experts that we have this evening we can pick at the surface of what can be done and how we can improve the soils for the future. I'm first going to go to our distillers and just ask about their approach to agriculture because each one that's on the panel this evening is quite deeply connected. We're first going to go to Douglas just to give a bit of a background on Brickladdy and our connection with agriculture and the journey that we've been on since we reopened the distillery in 2001. So Douglas, can you give us a bit of background on the approach that Brickladdy has had? I can. And this seems really topical at the moment because um, what was happening in Glasgow, picture this over 20 years ago, two decades ago, uh, a couple of wine merchants come to Scotland and decide that they're going to resurrect a whiskey distillery. Um, and they're going to bring their knowledge of terroir and their knowledge of ingredients and flavor, and they're going to apply those rules to the world of whiskey. And actually, at the time, it was just madness. You know, it was, it was completely bonkers. Never mind the notion that barley wouldn't be treated a, as, a, as a commodity. Um, they were going to turn this Victorian distillery that was built in 1881 into something that would be avant-garde again, that would be forward-thinking and lead from the front when it came to barley and the role that barley would have in creating flavour in the world of single malt, because at that point, of course, flavour didn't come from, from the, the commodity at all. It came from the shape of the still or it came from the barrels. So this notion that, that at Brookladdy they were going to change the way we thought about ingredients was the very, very beginning. And, and as soon as you start to look at ingredients and you start to understand flavor and you start to explore locally grown, so now over 52% of our barley is, is grown on Isla, but starting to understand organic, you know, what would, what would the pursuit of organic whiskey mean? And it was all about flavor at that point. And it was back in 2003. And I'm sure Annabelle will, will talk about selling organic whiskey or making organic whiskey in today's climate. But back in 2003, this was, again, crazy. It was it was madness. And then to, to partner up and understand flavor that might come from ancient land races, genetically diverse barley varieties like bear barley and partnering with the University of Highlands and Islands and the Agronomy Institute and thinking about bear barley, you know, really low agronomic yield, really poor distilling yield in many ways very complicated to make whiskey from six row head challenging but makes incredible whiskey really really different 
tasting whiskey. Not necessarily better or worse, but just different. Um, biodynamic. Richard talked about his partnership very briefly with us for over 10 years. I've actually got a, a sample here, Richard, of the 2011 biodynamic, but this was a sample that I drew from cask in 2015, so it's been in my collection here at home uh, for we were a long a bit time. Worried. We were a bit worried that we hadn't sent you a sample and we'd forgotten about you, Douglas, but we needn't have worried. <laughs> so you've been pilfering I've, got it, I've got it to my own archives. I've got it to my own yeah. archives. But you start to look at biodynamic, and again, you know, the pursuit of flavor was at the forefront of our of our um, original contact with Richard to, to try and get biodynamically grown barley or malted barley to turn it into, into Bricladi whiskey. And then, of course, Isla Barley, you know, trying to trying to create value in the ecosystem and trying to have barley grown on an island, the island that we are based, rather than importing it from mainland Scotland or from, from the rest of the UK or indeed uh, abroad. So all of this comes together and your pursuit of flavour starts to unlock this idea of agriculture and the connection between agriculture and whisky. And then suddenly you're exposed to the sustainability side of things and coming back to beer barley is a really interesting example not only was it a, a, an ancient land race not only did it create very different tasting whiskey but it was genetically diverse and it grew in poor soil it grew in a short growing season um, it represented a, a rural ecosystem in the orkney islands as well so we were able to partner up with the agronomy institute and then I suppose help them get the bare barley project off the ground again and suddenly it was being used by local breweries and suddenly it was being used by um the the millers and bakers and things like that as well so suddenly you see the interdependency between one project and another and that starts to create this notion of sustainability into into eco rural ecosystems and then just moving on again we we, we were given the opportunity to buy a small croft beside the distillery. So back in 2016, 2017, and the original idea in truth was that we would grow, grow our own barley there, our own homegrown barley. And perhaps we would we would release a product there, what, uh, release a product from there one day that was our, our you know, home croft release. And before we did that, there was this idea that we should, we should stop and just pause and reflect because we were starting to become aware of the, the need to move away from the modern farming practices and perhaps pay attention to some of the um, notions of sustainable agriculture or crop rotation or regenerative agriculture. So we created a, a moment in time and we had a, had a Croft Summit and uh, Richard was there with us, Steve was there with us, and we just stopped and said, what should we do? How should we um, invest in this Croft for the greater good? And, and how could we share the risk? How could we keep value in the community, still pursue flavor, understand regenerative farming practices or sustainable agriculture practices and um, work with the farmers and really try and create proof of concept to, to move things forward. So once you've gone into that space, you start to think about, well, there needs to be demand for this type of barley. So if this type of, you know, when you look at suggested growing lists or recommended growing lists, the criteria that they're being bred for bar modern barley varieties, yes, disease resistance, but also speed of growth or price or yield. Um, but, you, but you start to think, well, nobody is requesting flavor and nobody is request, requesting genetically diverse and nobody is requesting barley varieties that might put nutrients back into to the soil or um, alternative cereals that could be planted in a crop rotation cycle. The other, the other one I've looked at here is the 2017 rye, which maybe we'll talk about later. But you know that's born out of crop rotation. It's not born out of um, the idea that rye whiskey might be popular and we could you know make some and bottle some and, and, and make some money out of it. So long story short, madness. You know, coming out of the 1990s, this idea that terroir from wine could be taken into into whiskey pursuit of flavor slowly giving way to an understanding about sustainability and the need for a different perspective on the in the connection between whiskey and agriculture and farming and politics and the environment and society and here and here we are today sitting here with these wonderful bright minds um online tonight talking about the notion of uh, agriculture and whiskey and how important it is so it, it really a very interesting journey and, and i'm trying to cover it off lots of points in a very short in a very short window but i'll pass back to you christy 
It is a bit of a challenge. I think um, one of the interesting things that you've touched on there is almost that people don't really know that they want something until we create it. So it's an interesting concept. The more we look at COP26 and the themes that are going on there, we almost need businesses to choose what the direction is and what the responsible direction is for that to then be offered to consumers and for consumers to be given the choice to support those products. So while we've learned that um, we've had to create the demand for things in a long time, you have to have the kind of ballsy people that are in the in the room this evening or in the virtual room to be able to make those decisions and to say, do you know, we are actually going to take this decision and, and do this and, and almost hope that people <laughs> want it and buy it at home. Which probably brings me nicely on to Annabelle. Um, Annabelle's distillery, Nick Nian, on the just a further north on the west coast of Scotland, alongside um, having their own biomass plant and having 100% post-consumer recycled glass, which if you're in the industry is a very big coup, um, they also buy and distill 100% organic barley. Annabelle, can you enlighten us on what motivated you <laughs> to choose 100% organic? Please. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, Annabelle. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I've learned that by now. Um, so we are um, interesting listening to what Douglas was saying. We have come at this from completely the opposite end of the spectrum, but have perhaps ended up in quite a similar place. So when I was thinking about setting up McMean, it was all about sustainability and trying to look at sustainability across the whole ecosystem of the distillery. So you mentioned, Christy, that we have biomass boiler for producing the heat needed in the distillery. Um, we thought about packaging, we have closed loop water systems and so on. Um, but I was looking at the supply chain and thinking, well, where is the biggest impact, in particular from a carbon point of view in the supply chain, but also in all other aspects of, aspects of sustainability, like biodiversity. Barley is obviously a really important part of whiskey, both in terms of creating the flavour, but also in terms of purchasing impact on the land. And also connection to that land. and um, there were very few people doing organic products at the time. Brookladdy was one of the very few. Um, and it struck me as odd. Um, I knew from my own personal experience, if you eat an organic carrot, it seems to be more flavoursome than a non-organic carrot. Um, but also more practically, the impact that farming organically has on the land around the farms and the biodiversity that you can see with your own eyes, but also the things that go uh, unseen like the impact on the water environment around the farms seemed to me to be very profound and so alongside all of the other things we were doing in sustainability I really wanted to make sure that we were doing as much as we could to protect the environment along back along our supply chain and in particular on our farms given what a big impact that has so um, we made what felt like a very big decision in 2015 a couple of years before we started distilling to only source organic barley and the reason it felt very brave back then was partly because there wasn't the conversation about sustainability that there is now and partly because it's extremely expensive and the last thing that you really need is a new distillery is more expense in the few years before you can even sell the whiskey um but i'm very glad we did partly because i think it was exact it was the right thing to do but also because we discovered uh the impact we think it has on flavor so we released our first single malt last year and we had watched the spirit evolve over time and felt that the organic barley actually added a real depth of flavour and a richness to the spirit, which we wouldn't have otherwise achieved. So I guess that was a nice bonus for having uh, having invested in what was otherwise very expensive barley. It, it does seem like a win-win. Good for flavour, good for the planet, just epically expensive. Exactly. <laughs> it seems to be the way of things. There has to be some sort of toss up. And just from a geeky perspective, I guess, I'm quite interested to know, has that put challenges on your supply chain in terms of, you know, can you expect a low yield some years and how do you manage that within your distillery? Well, interestingly, we actually were given terrible warnings by various people in the industry when we were trying to make this decision as to whether to go on organic or not, that it would be extremely hard to manage, that you know, the distillers would have a nightmare using it, et cetera, et cetera. And none of that has actually transpired. Um, we, from a supply chain perspective, yes, the yields are lower per acre of land. And that's why 
largely it's so expensive. Um, but it is not quite as unstable a product as you might be led to believe. We're actually in the middle, and I'll talk about this a bit later, but of transitioning our supply um, from 10 farmers down to two. Um, yeah. And we initially went with 10 farmers because I was a bit nervous about that continuity of supply, but actually over time, we've grown a lot more confident in, um, I guess, our farmers' ability to manage that. So. Brilliant. I mean, it, it sounds like you don't really have any issues and we should all be doing it <laughs> all of the time. Well, indeed. And in fact, I think if um, if more people did it, it would encourage more farmers to go organic, which would be fabulous. So, Yeah, absolutely. Christy, yeah. can I, um, I, I'm just as Annabelle saying that, I'm, I'm reflecting on a, a piece of writing that was done about Brucladi distilling organic barley. And it's just to back up what, what Annabelle's saying. And it says, Organically grown barley um, first took place, was first distilled back at Brickladdy in 2003. They claim the contrast to normal barley was almost startling. The taste, the aroma, even the mouthfeel was brim full of what was called an organic creaminess, the like of which had never before been experienced. And it, it's just so true, isn't it? So that, that change that you could get from the methodology the farming practice coming right through to the spirit itself it was fascinating brilliant okay we're going to move on to david now who has come from a farming background so the spirit of yorkshire i believe grew out of of the family farm david do you want to lend some of your wisdom to us from your farming background and your approach to agriculture yeah sure um first of all the farm is is my business partner's farm it's it's the mellis farm it's um third generation barley farm uh, right in the middle of yorkshire and um i suppose the we, we new kids on the block in terms of distilling i suppose a bit like annabelle um but we um we've been three generations of, of growing barley my personal background is um also uh, crop science as well and dealing with with um, barley and i used to buy and sell barley for 30 odd years so um you know our sort of knowledge of cropping and um making sure that we're doing the best things we possibly can to produce the best barley we can uh goes back a lot of time um so we come from that 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 point and uh, really the distillery and the brewery before this was set up to underpin that farming um, background and underpin, underpin the farm. Um, we had two main ingredients that we, we, we knew we did pretty well. One, one was barley and the other one was um, a water source directly under our feet. In fact, the, the farm has never had mains water. So, um, you know, those two are the main ingredients for making uh, beer and, and obviously whiskey. So in, in 2003, I think it was, uh, Tom set up a Walt Top Brewery and started making uh, beer at the time when um, other farms were diversifying. They were looking at other ways of, of generating income other than just uh, arable cropping. Um, and, and that was a direction that, that Tom went, went in at that time. Um, but it clearly was the first step in, in, a, in a long story of how we, we started producing whiskey, be it the same sort of process as, as the first process of making beer is almost identical to making the wash for whiskey. So. It was absolutely logical for us to to move down that road uh, and after a bit of research realizing nobody had ever made um whiskey in yorkshire before it was uh, sort of sealed the deal really um but it was really underpinned by that farming background and our knowledge of the fact we were sitting on the yorkshire worlds which grow some incredible crops of, of malting barley um and having two of the biggest malting businesses situated here as well so they were here for a reason um, and that was hopefully um, taking in the barley crop in the lowest mileage possible from the farms in the area um, so so really that's our background and and how we got going with with uh, the brewery and then the distillery and have you tried or trialed anything that's been kind of new and different to what you've known and what you've grown up with and what you've experienced yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're in a very privileged position uh, that we are planting the seed we end up putting in the bottle. Um, you know, there's not many people who can claim that, but also we take that, that responsibility very seriously. And we look at ways um, of um, 
doing the right thing for the soil. So we've we started a couple of years ago um, with no um, uh, tilling at all. So we weren't actually plowing the, the soil at all. We're direct drilling straight into the previous seed bed. And that has a massive impact on not just the soil health and the structure of the soil and maintaining its uh, integrity, um, but also uh, not releasing carbon into the atmosphere, which is obviously uh, on, on a great big subject we're talking about uh, at the moment. So, um, you know, we've been doing that on half the farm for two or three years now. Uh, we did see a small yield drop to start with, but that soon recovered. Um, and the gap between drilling, we're sowing cover crops. So we're putting in um, from sort of uh, harvest in September through to uh, drilling again, uh, we're putting in cover crops, which have a massive impact and benefit to the soil. Um, you know, we're putting in grasses and legumes, which are fixing nitrogen, um, grasses that are actually uh, tying up uh, carbon to the, the root ball. Um, and, um, you know, we, 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 we're using the best sort of known practices now to try and make sure we look after that soil for the next generation. Amazing. And do you have a, a market for the crops that you're sowing in between barley harvests or do you have livestock that feed on the land? Well, it's, it's a cover crop. Uh, it's not a cash crop, so it's not one that's designed uh, to actually make money. It's one that's designed to protect the soil. But obviously, if you've got a green plant in, in the ground pretty much all year round, uh, you know, you're sequestering carbon all of the time. Um, and, you know, unlike a deciduous tree, uh, which loses its leaves pretty much uh, half of the year, um, you know, this sort of farming practice is a very good way to uh, sequest carbon and make sure that we're, we're, we're doing the right thing for soil at the same time. Brilliant. So, and does that come through on the on the brewery side as well? Are you juggling between the distilling side and the brewery side, fe feeding both of them in? Yeah, I mean, the barley varieties, we use exactly the same varieties for both purposes. Um, we, we malt them slightly differently. Um, but uh, fundamentally, we're, we're growing 300 acres of malting barley every year. Uh, we've just gone back to a, uh, a winter variety as well. Um, so we'd, we've trialled that last year and it did very well. Um, but predominantly, it's been spring varieties for, for, for a lot of years. Um, the beauty of a winter crop, obviously, as well, is it, it's in the ground quickly. It's established quickly and uh, it's uh, photosynthesizing and doing its job quickly in terms of uh, um, sequestering carbon. So, um, you know, uh, it's really important as well to have a really good rotation. Uh, so we do grow the things on, on the farm as well, clearly, and only half the farm is down to barley. So, um, yeah, it's, it's important that uh, you take it seriously because if we keep intensively growing any crop, you know, regardless of it being, being barley, um, and not look after the soil structure, then we won't have many harvests left. And I think that's a message we need to get out to not just uh, our communities, but the farming communities as well. Yeah, that, I mean, that you've almost created a brilliant segue for me there to move on to Richard, who I believe has completed a thesis um, going so far in his farming delights that he wants to really study and get into this. So, Richard, can you frame for, for us in a way that we don't obviously want to be so negative that we scaremonger everyone into not buying whiskey anymore but just can you give us a bit of context about the kind of issues that we're facing as we go at arable crops in the future yeah thanks christy yes i have finished and i uh, yeah, i do have my doctor title now which is great very oh, exciting <laughs> you'll we'll update the website just thanks while we're that. chatting <laughs> Yeah, and so I'm passionate about the soil, so passionate that I decided to do a PhD on it as early. Um, so it, the, the premise is really that everything, really everything comes from the soil and that soils are multi-talented. You know, they provide clean air, water and food. So our civilization, as people are alluding to, uh, relies on growing food and fibres in the soil, fibres for clothing, of course. If the soil is washed or blown away, then we simply cannot grow food, or it becomes more expensive to do so. Degraded soils increase flood and drought and, and release carbon into the air. Greater than that, though, really, 
uh, in fact, all terrestrial life relies on the soil. All terrestrial food webs begin with the soil and damaging the soil pollutes oceans. And so actually, if you take it in, a, in totality, all biodiversity relies on healthy soil. So just to explain how the soil works in simple terms, the soil is made up of four parts. It's a mixture of rock dust, water, air, and organic matter. But it's the organic matter that is the small and clever bit. So soil organic matter is, is the product often of thousands of years of plant, animal, but mostly soil organism activity, like earthworms and fungi. Whilst making their homes in the soil, bugs stick the soil particles together, creating a sponge, which is full of chains of carbon compounds, such as sugars and proteins. What science is realizing is that it's the diversity of all these plants that are growing and the bugs that are living in the soil that are so important. Historically, we can see that soil organic matter relied on permanent plant cover to feed these soil organisms and to protect the soil from washing and blowing away, as I mentioned. But when we cut down rainforest or plow up permanent pasture, this reduces the food available for soil bugs. So they consume the soil organic matter instead. And the soil organic matter sponge clearly then shrinks and the carbon is lost and then we get flooding and drought as, as we're experiencing on the news all too often. As farmers, the more we disturb the soil and the less diversity of plants we grow, the more damage we inflict. So the current rate of carbon loss from UK soils, it's estimated to be about a tenth of the total carbon emissions from UK industry. That's a serious amount. As Lady uh, Eve Balfour famously said, the health of our soil, plant, animal, and man is one and indivisible. But what I find exciting is that the solutions are simple. And perhaps I'll just pause there and, and let some others join in and, and I can come back to our solutions a bit later. Yeah, brilliant. And I mean, that is quite profound, the way that you've managed to connect Yes, okay, it is the soil beneath our feet, but without the soil beneath our feet being treated in a healthy way, it's the oceans, it's all all of nature that takes part in it. So it really is quite serious. And as you see, it is a very simple solution and something that we can all play a part in. Like lots of this climate change can feel like it's businesses or it's governments and it's legislation that has to take part. But I personally believe that our food and drink systems are fundamental in starting to address this. And if we can afford to kind of eat and drink sustainably, that is one of the single most things that we can do to make a change. Um, Steve, if you are online, <laughs> would you like to explain a little bit about what your role is at the at the Bread Lab and where, where you see barley breeding and wheat breeding fitting into all of this? Sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Christy. Um, the, we're plant breeders here. So my program was started in 1894. Uh, we breed barley, wheat, and rye. In 1995, we declared ourselves GMO free. Uh, we worked then primarily or uh, heavily into organic. Uh, lately, we've become 100% organic in our in our breeding efforts. And uh, I agree with what Annabelle said and and um, and Douglas, but I'll disagree with one thing Annabelle said is that uh, organic yields less. It does now, but it doesn't have to. And it doesn't have to if we control the weeds and get the fertility up through cover crops, as others have, have already mentioned. So there's no magic to um, organic yielding less. There's a bit of a myth of it as, as well. And we, we shouldn't take that as a default. I, I think, and not that Annabelle did, but it's, it's very common to go that way. Um, we work with, with ancient heirloom and heritage. We have a, a room in the back here that has over 8,000 different lines in it. We improve them though. So, so Douglas talked about bear barley. We grow bear. Um, we're also interested in making it better and making it different. 
which is how it was originally designed, right? So um, we're breeding bear to be black, purple, and blue right now. And we, everything we do is on a population basis. So we develop, in essence, new versions of land races. So we don't do pure line uh, breeding. I was a commodity breeder for over 20 years, and my job was to make everything the same. Um, no one on this panel wants everything the same, I don't believe. So I, I got out of that system about 12 years ago and founded the, the Bread Lab. And, um, and that's our goal, really. Um, we see going forward in the time of climate crisis as diversity being the key. Diversity being the key, not only in the soil, but in the genotypes, the plants that we put in there. So again, we, everything we do is, is based on a population basis. That takes maltsters to be able to, um, to accept variation. Uh, right now, big industrial maltsters will not, but we work with a craft maltster uh, right here. That's just a few minutes from our lab. They're the, the largest craft malt house in the US by three times. So it's Skagit Valley Malting. We also work with Westland Distillery in Seattle, which is partners um, with Brook Lottie. So they, they both have the same thing in mind of of bringing sensibility into our farming systems through variation, through regenerative natures, through organic animal integration, whatever it takes. Uh, one example on how variation is so important in a time of climate crisis is in our recorded temperature history here. So again, we're north of Seattle. We're similar to Isla and other areas of, of Scotland in terms of being temperate, cool, wet, windy, whatever you want to say. We've never been 100 degrees here in recorded temperature history, which goes back 150 years or so. 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's about 38 uh, C. We got to 103 here this year, so which is um, 40 or so C. That was a heat dome that, that, in essence, could have killed all of our breeding population if it was all the same, but it wasn't. So we had some lines that did horribly. We did, had some that did very well. Um, that's what diversity brings. And, and Annabelle mentioned the, the resilience of, of her organic uh, crops through the growers, right? We can add resilience through, through diversity, and we think that's important. We also work on winter types. So, so a, a measure of how conservative uh, maltsters can be is, is demanding uh, just spring types. So, and we heard earlier today about uh, uh, winter types. Winter types are a strong uh, part of a rotation uh, for sure, just covering the soil for longer. And um, we work on winter, spring, we work on black, purple, blue. We're not so interested in blonde um, malting barleys because everyone is working on those. So we try to try to go into areas where others are not. So, and it, again, we, we have a strong partnership with, um, with Berglotti and also Westland in there their partners as well. So um, I think I could leave it there if that sounds right. Yeah, and I think um, you've touched on something there, which was that crops can be um, naturally resilient to something. But I think, Richard, if I can just go quickly back to you, you have talked about the fact that, um, that crops can develop a natural adaptation. So we're Steve is saying there about temperature variation. Can you touch on a little how your farming system helps to um, promote crop adaptability? I think most of the, the strength comes from the soil, really, because by having a, a vibrant and lively soil, you're then setting up the plant to be, to be uh, I don't, I'm not a great fan of the word resilient, but but to be more adaptable uh, as a result. So a, a, a lively and uh, soil that's full of uh, soil organic matter will actually store more water. And uh, both when, when we have a flood, but also when we have a drought. And so you get a much more tolerant system that, that the plants are therefore more happy to cope with. In, uh, from a, a simple idea like pH, so I think most people will be familiar with the concept of pH and acidity, uh, some acid soils, uh, you, know, you can't grow barley in, for example, if it gets too acidic. Whereas when you buffer that soil with 
the organic matter, which is alive and, and, and dynamic and, and full of energy, that then creates an environment which the body will be happy to grow in. So it's, it's uh, the, the more organic matter you have in the soil, then the, the, the happier the plants become. It's, a, uh, it's all based around the soil. Everything, as I already mentioned, everything comes from the soil. But the other thing we do do is save our own seeds. We try and save our own seed each year that then uh, uh, we get uh, is the seed more accustomed to the environment. It's better to have a, a population as uh, Steve was talking about, but we're not quite there with that yet. <laughs> I'm sure it will come <laughs> with, with trial. I think that's interesting how um, Steve has, has talked there about, uh, or Richard started with a holistic farming system, how we have to start with the soil and have a symbiosis with the whole farming ecosystem. And then Steve has also pinpointed on how we need to have quite an interdependency between the farmer and prioritising targets for them to have a, a viable business model. And maltsters have to have flexibility and tolerance for um, variety and diversity, but also for the distillers to be able to, to ask for that, the likes of um, Nick Nian who go in and, and really put a, a, a stamp on it and say it has to be 100% organic. So I think the interesting thing here is we're moving away from a one catch-all kind of commodity system, but it is still a very holistic system where there's a lot of interconnectedness between it. Thierry, if you can hear us, <laughs> do you have anything to add from your from your background and how you've moved from kind of a commodity system into really a very practical hands-on approach in your in your gardens? Well, I was uh, you know when I, I was trained as a as a soil biologist, but I never learned about the life of the soil. I was basically trained in North Carolina, in the U.S. and it was basically, I just learned chemical control. That's what I did for 20 or 30 years when I was doing research with the, the, the federal government in Canada. And it's only after uh, when I became a genetic engineer because of, you know, I, I wanted more funding, etc. So I just felt it was plenty uh, uh, profitable for me to spend my time learning molecular biology. So I ended up with that. But it's only when I retired, I retired 20 years ago, and it's after I retired that I, I remember reading about the life of the soil, and the soil was a living organism. It had made no sense to me. So as much as I dug into that topic, I learned slowly that basically the bacteria, the fungi in the soil, and the, 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 the unicellular organism, the protists, which are feeding on the bacteria and which themselves are food for the nematodes and, and then on, on and on all, all the um, bigger trophic levels are basically the most fundamental thing in the soil. If you want your plants to be healthy, you need all these microorganisms to poop, manure, to feed the soil. There is no difference between cow and horse manure and those microorganisms. It's the same thing. They're releasing the minerals that the plants need. And as you just heard, carbon holds the water. So obviously, the more carbon in the soil, the more uh, crops, uh, cover crops, etc., the more you can bury in the soil, the more water holding you have, and the more nutrients, of course, to feed the life of the soil. And that's pretty much what I've learned in the last 20 years. I came across a lot of studies 10 years ago uh, what indicated that something that I didn't know either, that GMOs, GMOs were bad, GMOs were horrible, and when I was working, it, you know, I took the time to reassure people that GMOs were okay. But then I learned that all GMO crops were sprayed with Roundup. And that's where the rats, the rats were dying in experiments, and I became totally involved in that, in that movement, basically to speak against the use of glyphosate in agriculture. And I don't know how it's done in, in Scotland or even in, in, in England, uh, if the uh, barley or the grain crops are still sprayed with uh, glyphosate at harvest time, but it's definitely a normal thing to do here is in the USA and in Canada. And of course, that's contamination of the food supply, meaning basically, as perhaps some of you know, that uh, glyphosate is an antibiotic. It is patented as an antibiotic by Monsanto and it basically kills all bacteria. So of course it has a huge impact on the microbiome, on the human microbiome, as well as all the other organisms in the soil. 
And so it's a terrible thing to do. Um, questions? <laughs> do, do any of our farmers there have anything to add there? I feel like we've got a good, healthy, strong anti-Monsanto um, community <laughs> growing here. Does anyone want to jump in and add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, what I would say, you know, from, from the farming background is uh, if you're growing the right variety in the right field, in the right area of, of, of the country, you don't need this sort of chemical input. You know, it will it will die off naturally. I mean, I'm speaking about our our personal experience, obviously. But yeah, you don't need that. that. And I in all my years of, of dealing in, in this industry, I, I don't think I've come across one farmer who has actually sprayed off a crop of barley. Um, so, you know, it's, it's important, though, that people do realize that. And it, and it is important we keep that out of the food chain, for sure. Um, just going back to the organic matter, which I, I think we've touched on, is incredibly important for water retention, as, as we've said. And um, uh, Tom on the farm has been working with Yorkshire Water in our particular area um, to actually analyse how much 1% um, of organic matter holds in a hectare of of, of uh, um, arable land and that's 30 tonnes of water so typically you know you could get up to five or six percent organic matter in your soil so you're holding a dramatic amount of water back in that soil um, we're, we're situated on a on a on a highish land which is is the wolds the Yorkshire wolds but it drops down into Holderness which is um, the the Humber estuary which takes 25 percent of the water away from uh, from England, so it's incredibly important that we we uh, keep that water where it should be, uh, not just to grow the crop, but also um, to stop flooding. So you know, these are the sort of things we can think outside of a bottle of whiskey. We can think outside of um, you know growing the crop, but we can think about the whole environment when we're doing these sort of techniques. So, uh, question to you: How do you how do you do weed control without chemicals? Uh, we, we don't we don't use um, glyphosate for a start. I mean, we do have to use from now and again some sort of chemical input, um, but it is uh, less and less and less, and particularly with the way we're growing the crop. Um, and you know, intensive farming for us is a thing of the past. We're doing a lot more to try and reduce that input. You know, establishing the crop now costs us a lot, lot less uh, in terms of input and financially than it ever did. It's sort of 85% of the cost that it used to be, um, which, is, which is fantastic. So, uh, so the direct drilling and, and getting the crop established quickly, um, you know, defeats quite a lot of these problems. Thank you. You, you do wonder when, when I've heard time and time again that um, the more that you adapt to the right regionality and you've got diversity in your systems, the less inputs you have to make. We, we could get to a place where crops are cheaper if we're using less input, if the demand is there, and if we are encouraging others to, to do that. D does that sound hopelessly optimistic, or could we get there? Well, I, I think the important thing for us is that farmers have to uh, earn a living. They have to make sure that they are the beginning of the supply chain. And, you know, if people are willing to, to sort of pay and make sure that it's sustainable in uh, a farming sense, then that's a starting place. So I think that's an important factor. We, we, we can't grow crops for nothing. Um, you know, there is an input there and people need to understand there is a premium to be paid for organic or whatever, you know, to, to get that into, into the system. Um, you know, hopefully yields will increase uh, in this particular area and you're obviously seeing that in seattle um with with organic input which is great and uh you know we're all for that too so yeah absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely. I think if, if i could pipe in christy i think that that is one of the main roles of a, a plant breeder is to bring the price point down by bringing the yield up right that helps everybody right so we work with wheat as well and and we don't believe in bread that sells for 18 bucks a loaf just because it's ancient heirloom or heritage. And, and same with the barleys, right? Is if, if we can develop a barley that does everything that bear does, but yields 10 times as much, which we can, then we think people should be ready to go there. Well, okay, so we've started to talk, even in framing the context of what some of the issues are, we've st started to talk a bit about the solutions there. 
can we hear from just anyone who wants to jump in about we have covered a bit about how businesses can start to create solutions here but from a consumer level what what is the easiest way that people at home can start to support these farming systems that goes through the whole supply chain? Deathly silence, Christy. When I was visiting Steve in the Skagit Valley, it was really interesting to understand the notion of keeping value in the community and the the farming practices and the crops that were being grown perhaps were being sold at a more local price in the local community and at a marginally higher price further out so in key metropolitans whether it, whether it be um, in seattle or in other big cities so i think that there's something about i mean that 18 bucks for a loaf of bread example i think is pertinent here steve so maybe you could talk a wee bit about the the keeping value in the community narrative from the Skagit Valley, because I think that's a, a fascinating point. Right, and and we're we're interested in that. We're also interested in an appropriate scale and what that what that should be. Right. So again, we don't we don't believe in the and I sorry if there's a little noise we're baking here in the lab right now, but um, that that just because it's local, it should cost more. Right. Is is kind of an excuse at times. Right. So. We, we believe in, in keeping value where it's produced. And what we mean by that is when I was a commodity wheat breeder uh, and then working in barley is the value is created somewhere. It's then grabbed, right, by the commodity claw, taken somewhere else, and then the real value is added, right? We don't, we don't need to add value per se within a regional uh, agricultural economy. We just need to not lose it to another region. Right. So we believe in in the replicability of, of what's going on, right? And that that fits right into the genetics and the diversity and everything else, right? Is is each region has their thing, but the fact that a mature system for us, a, a completely mature agricultural system, is one where regional food is not more expensive, um, organic does not yield less, right? So that, those are pretty good goals to go after. Right. To, again, to bring the price point down, even even whiskey at 100 bucks or 150 for a very high end whiskey, um, that has its value. Right. And, and that can be affected by the price coming in as well. So we believe in in price points coming down by yields going up in a reasonable, respectable manner. And what I mean by that is fewer inputs, not more. Right. So can we develop barleys in this case? that will yield highly and can we work with farmers directly as Christy said to find out their challenges in, in a rotational type of system. We grow 80 crops in the valley that we're in right here, right? And wheat and barley are 79 and 80 in terms of economic value. They were, but now they're gaining because they have a place and a, a name and a terroir and a nuance and everything else. So that's what I would say. Great. Annabelle, you unmuted earlier, and then you were rudely interrupted. <laughs> Would you like to offer? I can't remember what I was going to say now. <laughs> was it something about consumer solutions? Oh, yes. Yes, sorry. <laughs> it's a very obvious answer to that, which is vote with your wallet. <laughs> um, choose products that are, you know, do those things that we've just been talking about, that source sustainable products, whether they're organic or not. There's lots of different forms of sustainability as we've been hearing about. And I think that is the way that the message will get to businesses. Yeah, to totally agree. As a, a B Corp certified business, that's something that Brookladdy very much advocates. And um, there's an amazing directory on, um, on the internet, on the interwebs, which we even have on ILO, where if you type in B Corp directory, you can literally filter by the country and the um, the type of product you're looking for, and you can start to find alternatives that are doing just that, putting value into the whole supply chain um, and really being ethical across lots of different areas, whether that's um, in the environment with their customers and their governance and, and everything else. Richard, is that you who's <laughs> unmuting? <laughs> I did, yes. Uh, yeah, I use a similar phrase, with the power of your wallet. Uh, Absolutely, same same concept. 
And I think it's important when you're talking about the cost of food sometimes just to realize why some food is cheap and that actually some of the externalities, uh, some of the pollution uh, isn't included, isn't factored into the cost of a product. So it's paid by someone else, probably the planet, um, but through pollution and picked up by taxpayers or, or you know, if we have a farming system that uh, that doesn't support biodiversity, that that doesn't um, encourage farmland birds, then that has consequences and costs eventually. And we're seeing those borne out in, in climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, and what's exciting about the way we grow, uh, we're essentially a closed farm system. So we don't bring, out, bring in, uh, we're very limited. It's what we bring on, onto the farm. So we bring some seeds in that we can't produce ourselves uh, and, uh, and a little bit of wood chip and that's about it. And uh, we grow in diverse ways in rotation with our cereals. And these are the, the fuel, if you like, that the, the system drives uh, from. And diverse in the way that there's 23 different species in our mixture currently. And um, it's this diversity of, of species that all these plant roots occupy a different zone in the soil. Some species will do well in one year, some will do well in another year, some will do well in a different part of the field to a to another species. And so this diversity is almost like an insurance policy from that point of view. Um, uh, and that creates the, the life and healthy energy in the soil that then feeds the following crops and gives that uh, um, energy to those crops. And that's such an important part of our, our system. So we're not bringing in anything to feed our crops, no, no organic inputs at all. We are organic, essentially, but biodynamic as well. And then we use light cultivations. Uh, and w one thing I've discovered uh, through my research is that actually the cultivation of the soil is an important part of the dynamic activity and it, it changes the uh, mix of soil organisms there. And I think that they then become more adapted to the annual crops that we grow, the cereals that we grow. So there's these mesophilia, which are these middle some of these bugs, um, Calimbala, the one in particular, that, that feed on on pathogenic fungi, for example. Uh, and so they form part of our uh, holistic system that, that happen to eat um, fungi that aren't too good for you, uh, or too good for the crops, for example, in the soil. Uh, and so our cultivations actually promote them, which is uh, sort of neat result um, out of the research we've done. And all our crops need to be competitive. Weeds can be a problem. And uh, so by having a system that builds in a competitiveness, are growing uh, wheats and uh, oats and barley, which are naturally adapted to, to compete with the weeds that are random, then we keep the weeds because the weeds are really important in feeding farmland birds and the insects and the little mammals that live in the fields and the soil birds. Uh, the weeds are absolutely critical in that process. Um, and they create the diversity when we have uh, our cereal crop. So, yeah, it, it's all so interconnected and and uh, comes back to that point about expensive, I think it's just a point of view. Um, and one of the things I'm, I think I'm constantly being challenged about is you know, the amount of food that's being produced. Well, if we all went organic, uh, we wouldn't produce enough food. I just think that's just the wrong question to be asking because actually there's three times the amount of obesity on the planet than there is hunger. That doesn't mean to say there isn't hunger, there is. But it's a case of distribution of food. And uh, I think changing the type of food we, we eat as well. A lot of food is being produced to, to feed monogastric animals like pigs and chickens. Uh, and I feel we should be feeding our pigs and chickens on, on grass lays. Um, things that we as humans can't eat. So everything we produce on our farm is for, is for, for, for selling to humans to eat uh, or drink, uh, of course, excitingly. Um, and in order to get an income from our grass lays, the we, grow, uh, we, we feed those to cows. And the cows, as uh, someone said recently, are ecosystem engineers, much like our earthworms, in helping to develop the life in the soil. They're a really important part of that process. And so. Um, 
cows have a, such an important uh, value in a farming, mixed farming system. Uh, perhaps I'll come back to that a bit more later. <laughs> the time is now, Richard. <laughs> uh, well, if you want me to talk about cows, that's great. <laughs> Maybe we'll give you a separate offshoot of <laughs> of Richard's biodynamic farm. We can do a um, we'll dump in every week. Well, yeah, I, I think that's interesting that we um, it's it's not that what we have in our life right now is has to completely be eradicated. It's that we might just need to shift our attention round a little bit and to make sure that we're supporting the systems underneath the things that we want to enjoy um, and Jane who's working on her socials desk this evening um, put me on a, a kind of sound bite that was saying luxury is allowed so whiskey should be allowed it is a luxury product after all but if we make sure that we're doing <laughs> if we make sure that we're doing the right things to make sure it's sustainable across the whole process. And I'm sure there's seven other episodes we could have about, you know, packaging and transport and, and all the rest of it. But of mention on the socials desk, there have been some of you that have been diligently watching along and commenting. So to Jane, do you have a question from the audience you'd like to put to the team? We've got a lot of questions, yeah. There's a really healthy audience of people out there, happy to say, across three different channels. Mostly on Facebook, we've got a good 60, 70 people on Facebook watching on and uh, uh, double figures on Twitter and, and uh, in the 20s on YouTube there, which is great. Uh, one comment I'd just like to relay to the panel, which is from Grant Anderson on Facebook. He says, the fact that all of you fine people are discussing this subject matter is hugely important. Thoughtful, sustainable approaches that are still business and farmer friendly are possible so long as everyone is solution focused. Thanks for letting all of us lay people in on the discussion. So, well, that's nice to hear, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we've got a few people who are thinking of peat, who are who mm -hmm. are concerned about sustainability of peat. That's maybe something for another day. Um, we had a lot of that in our, in feedback from our um, climate survey as well. And there's one question directed at Douglas, probably, and one at Steve, and then one general one. Just so, fire away. Um, Let's go with uh, Jason Cons from Austin, Texas, who's asking through YouTube. Oh, I just want to say as well, we've got an amazing <laughs> spread of people. There's Istanbul in there. We've got Ukraine, Taiwan, Germany, uh, Cambridge in England, um, all over the shop. So it's brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Uh, Jason in, top, in Austin says, does the robustness of barley varietals to changing climate conditions figure in distillery choices? Mm, it's, a, it's an interest. Maybe we'll go to Douglas for that one. But um, I, I think David touched on it slightly, which is that you have to pick what goes for your region. And there's an, an interesting quote from Jack Algier, who works on um, Blue Hill Farm in the US. And he, he said something along the lines of, and I'm paraphrasing, everything is right and nothing is right. So you have to find the solution that works for your region and the variety that works for your region and your distillery and I think my opinion would be that distilleries need to tap into that a bit more and be more supportive of their local community like I think that is our intention with the croft at Burkladi hmm. that because so much of the barley breeding that goes on to the recommended growing list that becomes the conventional barley varieties that we grow in Scotland if you go to the east coast and you breed on the east coast they're bred for east coast conditions they're not necessarily bred for west coast conditions that are wet and perhaps flummoxed with the geese and deer and things mm, some of yeah. that you can't control but Douglas do you have anything else to add there or have I completely missed the question well, I think the thing is about future proofing isn't it if it's if it's if climate's changing how can we hedge mm. for that well maybe that's one for the breeders then Miss Dr Jones if you're there yeah if we we know <clears throat> the climate's not just changing but it's chaotic and the, the way to deal with variation and diversity of the climate is variation and diversity in our fields. And, and then we have to, the growers, many growers know that, we need to work with maltsters and distillers and brewers and, and whoever, millers and bakers, and to deal with the diversity and ver, uh, variation that's coming their way, right? So again, as I said, in our country, big industrial maltsters, they will not tolerate variation. 
they can't, right? It, it doesn't fit their model. Um, so someone needs to, and who is that going to be? But yeah, if, if we want robustness, if we want to continue growing grains in these environments, we need to add tremendous amounts of variation and diversity. And that is not allowed in the commodity system. It's also not allowed in a lot of seed systems in the UK and, and much of the EU uh, as well, is we need to start agreeing that we need more diversity and variation in our fields. Douglas mentioned that bear is a it evolves. It's it's evolved for hundreds and hundreds of years. So we need to do that with our modern varieties as well. Another one? Do you want to go technical? <laughs> that wasn't technical. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got um, John Letts asking questions about um, on YouTube about high fertility and whether I'd be interested to know what the channel the panel think about nitrogen. As an input and how they maintain fertility. I'm not going to attempt to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say um, a little, I'll say a little uh, okay. bit about this. Oh, David, after you, no, please. No, no, Are you sure? <laughs> I don't want to jump in there, but I mean, again, it comes back to having the fertility in the soil and growing that cover crop that's going to add a natural fertility. So, you know, within our, within our cover crop, we, we've got. Um, We've got sort of legumes that are naturally uh, uh, fixing nitrogen into the soil. And I think this, this is the important thing. You don't, particularly malting barley, it doesn't need a lot of input. It doesn't need a lot of fertility. Um, and, and that's why it does particularly well on our uh, farm, because uh, the natural fertility of the soil isn't particularly high. But if you do the right things and establish a crop well and get it away well, then actually your inputs are very, very low. And I think that's the beauty of growing malting barley particularly on our area. Well, I'm, I'm maybe, maybe connected to that then, two things. Oh. So, so we've had experience now with one of our farmers growing rye and um, using it as a cash crop in a crop rotation program. And, and the following year, going back to barley, finding that there was 30% less agrochemicals needed and the nitrogen levels were boosted as a, as a consequence of that crop rotation cycle. And I remember Jack Algier talking about this before and saying 70% of the cost base of when growing crops is linked to labor. And a lot of that labor cost is linked to the application of agrochemicals. So actually, whether you have a lower yield or a higher yield or your yield is the same, your profitability can still go up by having less input, less labor cost, and less um, cost based through agrochemicals as well. So I think it's it can be a, a cover crop, it can be a cash crop, and at the end of the day, you can still create value for the farmer. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in quick and then I'll stop talking for a bit. But um, <laughs> barley is an excellent crop for low nitrogen situations. We want low protein barley for malting and distilling so that's good that's the opposite of wheat wheat you want a high high protein which is high n which is high gluten an important point is if we're applying chemical fertilizer it is a nitrogen form only about 50 percent of it goes where we want it to or where the grower wants it to which is in the grain in this case the rest goes in the soil and the air and the water right so there's only about a 50 percent efficiency there so Anything we can do to lower inputs um, through biodynamics, a perfect example of that, but lowering inputs is beneficial for the climate and for us and the economically as well. So, Great. You want one more? This is for Richard, probably. Uh, maybe for Thierry as well. <clears throat> we might open a literal can of worms. Is biodynamic farming more sustainable than organic farming? That's from Andrew Fisson on Facebook. I guess that's for me then. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. I, yeah, I think what's important in any farming system is the farmer. And it doesn't matter, if, you know, what type of farming you do. It all comes down to the farmer. The farmer is the most important the controlling factor in any farm business. And I, I was going to add that point to uh, crop var varieties as well. You know, when you're choosing crop varieties, it's uh, it actually needs to be the right variety and the right crop for the farmer because different farmers want to do different things. I hope they do anyway, because I think that makes us all 
different and, and interesting and, and unique. And, 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 you know, I'm particularly interested in growing the crops that I do because, uh, because they have a, their own intrinsic value. So the, the variety of barley that we grow is good for malting, for example. Someone else might want to grow a barley that's good for something else. And uh, the oats variety we grow similarly is called Mascani, and it's a, a very pretty variety. It glows. It's a sort of got a golden colour, and it, uh, you know, that's one that I'm sort of attracted to. And, and, and similarly, uh, we grow spelt, and uh, you know, I enjoy growing spelt because it, it grows very tall. Um, and so what my point is that it's about each farmer, and uh, and I, I think don't get too hung up on, on uh, one system or another. You know, do get hung up on the farmer and, and, and inspiring individuals. I think that's what's important. Um, although I do think when you're talking more generally about veganism, is something I want to bring up because I do. I think it's been such an important factor in, in in agriculture and certainly it's it's had a big influence on me in the last few years it's one of the reasons we did a carbon audit um several years ago because i was sure that our cattle were having a, a positive effect on our farm system but i couldn't prove it and after six months of, of research and debating with people I realized the only way was to, to do a carbon audit and just show that actually we were storing 10 times more carbon on our farm than we were emitting. And that was really powerful. And it shows that the importance of our, to me, it shows that it demonstrates the importance of our cattle and that we can see it actually in the soil organic matter that we've been sequestering. So, um, so it's the farming system that's more important than any one crop by saying that, you know, you shouldn't eat, uh, uh, meat, for example, it's missing a point. You, you know, you need to be more nuanced than that. You need to actually think, why is it that people are, um, don't want to eat meat? Well, maybe they feel that they, it's the only positive uh, change that they can make. But actually, um, by looking more carefully at the, car, the, the, the farming system that it's produced in, then you can, uh, from that point of view, uh, you, you can actually have a much more uh, clever uh, conversation with with the products that you, that you want to buy. And I think that's so important to, to then reconnect with the food you're eating, the drinks you're drinking, and um, how they're produced. Uh, and going back to the point about whether, oh, so directly whether biodynamic system is more sustainable or, or than organic. Well, uh, intrinsically, it, it has to be because all biodynamic systems are essentially a closed farming system. And, and the idea is that, that you're therefore sort of almost protecting your, your system from externalities, from some in, inadvertently buying something in that you, you might find was a problem in, in, in 10 years' time. Um, and, and so that has to be a better, more sustainable solution to, to have a, a closed system. Um, and, it, and it is one of the uh, problems with the organic um, uh, rules, if you like, that you can buy some organic uh, uh, substitute inputs. And um, I know many organic farmers that don't, and uh, I have great friends who have really successful, sustainable organic systems. Um, so it goes back to the individuals again. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. It goes back to the individual in terms of farms and farmers and people voting with their wallet and just choosing at home what, what you choose to support. Can I bring it back to the distillers just for a minute? Dave, you're, you're raising your hand. I am absolutely desperate to drink this. Can we do that now? <laughs> no, this is purely for educational purposes. There's to be no fun in the drinking with you. I wasn't waiting yeah. to be asked, David. <laughs> no, I was trying to be polite, empty. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I hope everyone at home too has definitely got a bumper dram in front of them, whether it's Steve, who's eight hours behind us in... Uh, Washington State or Thierry in Canada. I hope, I hope everyone is drinking. 
but sustainable spirits. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so just to bring back to dis the distillers, and please do, you know, raise a, a glass if you would like. I'm going to leave you a bit of the biodynamic for next week. Um, Annabelle, let's go to you. What What do you hope for with Nick Nian and what's on the agenda for you next? Um, well, that is a very interesting question because actually a lot of the themes that we have been talking about uh, are reflected in our next move. So I mentioned earlier that we are in the process of reducing our supply chain from 10 farmers across Scotland to just two. And our reason for doing that is many fold, um, but primarily because we want to get be able to get a lot closer to those farmers and understand to Richard's point, exactly what those farmers are doing because organic is a very broad church and it can be really excellent and it can be okay-ish. Um, and we not only want to be able to understand what those farmers are doing and actually eventually help them to produce their own carbon footprints. And it is only, we believe, if you actually measure your carbon footprint that you can see where you can improve it or indeed if it's already excellent. Um, and work towards hopefully with them and influence them towards some of the regenerative solutions that David was talking about, no-till for example being a great one. Um, and we believe that it's only by kind of condensing that number of farmers that we're sourcing from that we can really hope to understand in more detail what our supply chain really looks like. So this is going to be a big change for us, it starts in January, it will also allow us to create single farm whiskies. Uh, which we can't do at the moment because all the 10 farmers barley is jumbled up um so it's pretty exciting on multiple levels from a actual product point of view this won't come to fruition for several years obviously but um in the short term it's all about kind of carbon management and understanding that in a lot more detail brilliant okay but yeah if anyone does have a spare minute i, I would thoroughly recommend going on to nick Nian's website and they do have a very beautifully designed and very accessible and easy to understand for people who are not experts and um, you've got your full sustainability report on there and that's something that we um as a team at Brickladdy hope hope to well it's much bigger <laughs> than yours because we're not good at saying things in a short way but um we're going to launch our impact report from b corp in the next couple of days but certainly look Look out for Nick Neans on their website. It's very nicely done. David, can I come to you next and ask what's next for Filey Bay at the Spirit of York Yorkshire? Yeah, um, I think one thing we haven't talked about is food miles. Um, you know, because we are very much uh, filled to bottle, our food miles are very low, and I think we've got to we've got to make sure that 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 message gets out to other people as well. That you know, we we can't be transporting. Uh, raw materials around the world to produce products um, and I think the whiskey industry is particularly good at, at sourcing locally and I think that's a really important thing that we would like to uh, sort of push out there really it's incredibly important um, you know we've grown a, a field of rye we're trying to uh, we're trying to really um, experiment with with different grains as well so that's quite an exciting thing for the future um, you know we, we've done sort of three or four months worth of distilling with rye, which, which was a challenge, but actually it's quite um, an enjoyable challenge, you know. Um, so we're, we're going to continue that sort of uh, process. But I, I think really just um, uh, get people on board with the fact that we're, we're trying to do everything we possibly can to produce a product which is uh, sustainable and renewable. And, uh, you know, all of our power up at the farm is, is, is generated by, by wind, by wind turbines. Um, and I think it's just getting that message out there. This is the important thing. We have to do this for the future of, of farming and, and the planet, you know. So I think getting the message out for the next uh, five years is really important for us. Brilliant. Douglas, do you want to jump in with some notes from Brickladdy? Yeah, I mean, there's there's loads going on at Brickladdy and it, it, never, never a dull moment. Um, talking about sustainability more broadly, energy is a big thing for us. So, um, you know, we've got a published sustainability strategy. You touched on the impact report briefly there, which I know will be coming out in the next couple of days. But from an energy point of view, we'll be hoping to decarbonize the distilling uh, side of our business. So the distillery operation side of our business, so scope one and two uh, by 2025, we've got really interesting green energy projects bubbling in the background. So um, that's a big thing for us. We've talked quite a lot about agriculture and biodiversity. Um, we mentioned briefly the Botanist Foundation, so not whiskey, but in our gin business. So we fund um, biodiversity and conservation projects 
on Isla and beyond. Uh, so, so certainly a biodiversity element, but also our agriculture side will be looking to move towards really progressive purchasing policies. Um, we'll be continuing to find a market for cash crops and crop rotation cycles. So things like rye, things like biodynamic that's just launching. But in truth, organic is a tiny, tiny part of our, of our business because there's still not a huge demand globally for organic single malt. So one of the things we'll be doing commercially is trying to still forge a path to create the market, to create the communication and the consumer appetite for these types of interesting barley varieties, whether they're organically grown or biodynamically grown or a, or a product of, of crop rotation. And then I think in packaging and waste, you know, huge inspiration from Nick Nian and um, Annabelle's journey in the in the, using more PCR glass and doing things like considering the the infamous Brickladdy tins that we use, you know, at what point is it no longer sensible for us to keep using tins um, if it's unnecessary secondary packaging? And at the same time, what does that mean for our bottle designs? How do they survive on shelf without having without having tins? And um, how do we create new bottle designs that are both lighter and that have a higher PCR content or are completely recycled? Uh, so there's a whole lot of operational things that are going on in there. And at the same time, we continue to invest into Isla in the community and, and building relationships with our farming partners. We've got 20 growers on Isla uh, growing for us at the moment. And also we're continuing to invest into, into things as diverse as high school bursaries and, and the um, bursaries for students at the um, Agronomy, uh, agriculture college as well. So, lo loads going on. Never, never a dull moment at all, um, and, and a huge appetite to keep pushing the boundary because we're always saying here that you know we're not comfortable just making and selling great grapes, but it's it's got to be more than that. It's got to be a positive force for change, um, and, and at times be an inspiration, and at other times following people that inspire us. So, that's um, that's where we're going with with a bit of pace. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, ho and hopefully with whatever area it is, we can inspire somebody to do something slightly different today, whether that's another distiller or, you know, encouraging other people to ask the right questions. And I know a lot of you at home have been asking lots of questions and you can join in a, a bit more after the fact using the hashtag whiskey is agriculture on Twitter and we'll try and get round all of them. We also did send out a sustainability survey this week which we were blown away with the responses to it. I think there was about 800 different comments to it. So we're slowly working our way through that and just really trying to open the discussion with everyone and have a conversation about it. Because even if we're not amazing at it right now, we are very much trying. I think after an hour and 20 minutes, we are ready to wrap up for the evening. So I'll just say a very profound thank you to everyone collectively for joining us this evening. I do hope you are talking into some drams now um, and you at home too. But thank you very much everyone for your insight and your education, which has been yeah quite incredible and quite weighty, but very optimistic, I would say. So thanks to all of you at home and uh, yeah, enjoy a dram and, and probably a good night's sleep for some of us. <laughs> Cheers, Christy. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Good night, all. <laughs> <laughs>